nobody here. I thought they were from him. Good evening. It's a great joy to be back again. I've never spoken here. I've been here a few times. I was just asking George. It's nearly three years from us here. Dennis Lyle was here taking meetings, and I came up to them. And before that, we were down the road at the Children's Mission a few years ago. So it's good to see some familiar faces again <clears throat> and some people that I haven't seen in a while. You know, it's nearly a year and a half or nearly two years ago from George booked me for this meeting. And I says, George, I don't know what sort of booking calendar you think I have that I'm booked two years in advance. But uh, anyway, there you go. And so a lot has changed, as I've already mentioned. Just 11 days ago, we welcomed our daughter into the world. And so we've been getting good sleep. Last night, she slept from 11 o'clock to half four this morning. So if she stays at that, we'll be happy enough. And anyway, tonight we're here under the title of what I was told of a builder's service or a tradesman's service. And therefore, I'm sure you're wondering, well, what do you know about building? Well, that answer is quite easy. Probably nothing. Up until two years ago, I didn't know very much about building. I could tell you plenty of things about concrete, about blocks, about sand, stones, and every other material you wanted to know, but very little about building until I decided to build a house for ourselves when we get married. And I can tell you after that, I want to know absolutely nothing more about building because it was a heartache from start to finish. And so you'll have seen that I'm from Carried Off Building Supplies, and that doesn't really matter. You'll see the lorries in the road, and you'll hear me talking about it if you know me, but that doesn't matter. Because tonight I'm here to talk to you not about lorries or about concrete or anything else like that. I'm here to talk to you much more importantly about what we have as a business. And what we have as a business is not important, but what we have as a family in our business is we have Christ. We're all saved, and that means far more than anything else <clears throat> in this world. And so I'm not going to keep you long here tonight. I'm not a theologian. I mix concrete every day and make blocks, and that's all I know mostly about. But I'm saved, and I just want to share a few verses with you and a few thoughts uh, on this subject tonight. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with us. If you don't have it, don't worry. I'm going to read it. And it gets very dry up here, so I'm going to pour a bit of water for myself. <clears throat> I watch some of these boys speaking for an hour, and I don't know how they can keep going without drinking, because it gets very dry. So Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Just three short readings tonight. If you don't have your Bible, don't worry about it. I'll read it out slowly, and I'll read it out maybe twice. <clears throat> Psalm 118 and verse 22. And it says, The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. And then over to the New Testament, into 1 Peter. 1 Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Verse 7 again says, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And for a final reading over in Acts, Acts in chapter 4. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4 and verse 11, and it says, This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. That last verse, verse 12 again, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You'll notice all these verses have something in common. You'll notice they all talk about the stone which the builders rejected. And so I can hear some of you asking, well, what's this stone referring to? This stone refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was born into this world we remembered it just a few short weeks ago at Christmas. And I'm sure most of you know that as Jesus' time went on, he was rejected. These verses talk about Jesus being rejected. And indeed, before Jesus went to the cross, he was rejected by the crowd when they yelled to crucify him. He was sentenced to death on a cross. And it's like this. Why did he go to the cross? Well, he went to the cross for you and for me. And as the Roman soldiers beat the nails into his hand and into his feet as they pierced his side, as they pushed the crown of thorns onto his head, he suffered all this for one reason, 
and one reason only, that we might have our sins forgiven and accept him as your Savior. Sometimes we think, we read the Bible and we read these verses of Jesus being crucified, and we maybe don't contemplate just what it was like. Well, Kenny Wilson was speaking this morning. He was saying about working the nail gun and shooting the nail into his thumb, how sore it could be. And that's just what it would have been like for the Savior to have those nails beaten into his hands. There's a little verse in the Bible that says this, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And as I was thinking of this passage, I was thinking, how can we relate it to real life terms? Well, whenever I was building a house, I built stone walls. I'm sure in Kilkeel you're known for stone masonry and stone men. And every time I would watch the stone men, this is what I would think of. Sometimes they would lift a stone, they would look at it and just throw it away. I remember saying to them, what are you throwing it away for? It's no good. It doesn't fit. No use. They didn't want to use it. And maybe tonight that's what your heart feels like here. You feel that Jesus, the Savior, is no good. You don't want it. You don't want him. It's no use. This salvation is no good for you. You do want him, and you have rejected him in your heart, and you want nothing to do with him. And maybe you're here tonight, and you know that Jesus died on the cross, and you think, but I'm not a bad person. I haven't done anything wrong. And maybe you're here tonight, and you just don't want to know anything about Jesus whatsoever. You're happy the way you are. You're happy in your life. You think you're okay. You're fairly healthy. Maybe all you want to do is just go out at the weekend and drink and party. Maybe you're not into that at all. Maybe that's nothing to do with it. And there's a bricklayer building a wall for us one time, and this is what he said to me. You're a church goer. I said, well, I suppose I go to church. I wouldn't say a church goer, but I go to church. He said, do you drink? I says, no, don't touch it. He says, you see, you're going to go to heaven because you haven't drank. He said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm quite happy to go to hell because I enjoy my drink. And I enjoy my partying, and I enjoy going out with my mates and going to the pub. And so to tell you the truth, I'm happy because I'll be in hell, and I'll enjoy still drinking down in hell. Well, let me tell you, that statement sent shockwaves down my body as he said that, that anybody would want to go to hell. And it may also be that you want nothing to do with salvation. And I hear this all the time. Just a few weeks ago, I was talking to somebody about salvation. He said, I don't want to get saved. I don't want anything to do with church. He said, I have seen enough of those Christians. I have seen them all. I've worked with them. They owe me money. They do things dishonestly. They do things wrong. But make no mistake about it, that God sees all. He knows every man's heart, and he knows what they're like. And although this may be true of some Christians, it may be true of some non-Christians, it may be true of some other people, it's like this. That's going to keep you out of heaven if that's your view on salvation. Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood that we might have our sins forgiven. And on that day when we meet God, and whether you're saved or whether you're not saved, you're going to meet God someday. And the excuse that you watch somebody and you didn't like their lifestyle, well, I hate to tell you, but it's not going to stand. That excuse is not going to stand for God. And don't let someone else stand in the way of you getting saved tonight. Maybe you're part of something. Maybe you're afraid of friends at work. Maybe you're afraid of somebody at school. Maybe you're afraid of somebody somewhere saying something to you that if you get saved, they'll disown you. But don't worry about it because God will always find a way uh, of bringing new friends and new people into your lives. And so tonight I'm going to tell you of three men. These are real life stories and I just want to share them with you. I think they're applicable here tonight. Well, let me tell you of man number one. I'm not going to tell you their name. Some of you might be able to work out who they are, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. Man number one. Man number one was the age in his 60s. He was a man of great value of this world, a great family man, successful in his business, lorries in the road. You'd have seen them up and down here, I'm sure. But let me tell you something he didn't possess. He didn't possess salvation. And many times he was spoken to of his own soul. And he said he didn't need salvation because he was all right, just the way he was. Well, one day he backed the lorry into the shed, Pulling the cover over the trailer, he fell off it and hit the ground. And as he hit the ground, he was killed. And I'll tell you something more serious than that. He was killed instantly. But if he died as he claimed the way that he lived, that he wanted nothing to do with Christ, and the reality is this. As he hit the ground, he didn't just leave earth, but he woke up in hell. And the reality of this is very plain, and it's very simple. And I said it wasn't going to be difficult tonight. I just want to be simple and just lay a few truths in front of you.
But tonight it's my responsibility to present the gospel truly and faithfully to you. And this word hell maybe sounds a bit severe, and it's not meant as a scare tactic, but if you reject the offer of salvation, then hell is the destination. You see, Christ is rejected. You end up in hell. And so point number two, we're going to look at Christ considered. And maybe you've come to this meeting here tonight and you're thinking, well, from what I've heard, yes, I'm interested in considering Christ. You realize there's something in your life's not right. You realize there's something you're missing. And you've sinned. You realize you've sinned. And you need to sort this out. Well, tonight, as you sit in your seat in this building, I want to know, will you consider Christ? And I'm going to ask you, will you consider him? And here's why you should consider him. It's three wee words, and it says this, God loves you. And tonight you should, sing, should consider Christ because he loves you. He loves me, he loves you, and he loves everyone here. And you're asking, well, how, does he, how do I know that he loves us? Well, it's very simple, because he sent his son to die on the cross for you. As I already mentioned, I have a wee daughter of 11 days old. And let me tell you now, I've only had her for 11 days, but if somebody asked me to give her up for anybody else here, and I don't mean any offense to anybody else here, I wouldn't give her up. I wouldn't give her up for anybody here. But Jesus was willing to give his son on the cross for us. And again, as we go back to the stone wall, watching the stone men building the wall, they would lift a stone, and sometimes they'd reject it. And that was a picture of us maybe sometimes just rejecting Christ right away. But then sometimes we watch the stone men, they'd lift the stone, and they would look at it, and they would consider it. They would look at it, as it going to fit? Is it going to work? And so tonight in this meeting, I'm asking, will you consider Christ? As the stone men looked at the stone and considered it, will you take Christ and will you realize that if you want eternal life, if you want to be in heaven, that the only way is you need to consider Christ? And maybe it's possible here tonight, you're thinking, you know, I would like to get saved, but to tell you the truth, I don't want to become a Baptist, or I don't want to be a Presbyterian, or I don't want to be a Brethren, or I don't want to be a Free P, or I don't want to be whatever. Well, that's okay. God isn't concerned with putting a tag on it. He's not concerned with labels or denominations or church. He's not worried if you're Protestant or if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter what you've done. It's very simple at this, that God, you're either saved or you're unsaved. And that's all God will look at. When God looks down, he doesn't look down at us tonight as Baptists. I used to go to the Brethren, so you can actually class me as party Brethren. I'm right, a free piece. So I don't know where you get that mix. But anyway, when God looks down tonight... He doesn't look down on me as a Baptist. God looks down on me as saved and ready for heaven. Or I look down on you as unsaved. And it doesn't matter what background you come from or where you've come from or what you've done. He doesn't look at all that. He looks at you're not saved. And so let me tell you of man number two. Man number two. Now the first one was in his 60s. And man number two was 42. Now the ages are, are important. And I'm saying the ages for a reason. Again, a successful man in his job. If I told you his name, I'll guarantee you that somebody here would know him. He was successful at his own business, comfortable living, had good friends, had a nice house, nice workshop, everything. And several years ago, this man came to a meeting in Northfield. And he left the meeting the first night that he came. He promised his friend he would come, wasn't that interested in coming. He said he'd been to churches whole life, didn't really want to know, wasn't for him, but he decided he'd come to keep a friend happy. And so he left the meeting after the first night, and he was gripped the entire night. He said he'd never heard a gospel message like it. He said he knew he needed to be saved, he needed his sins forgiven, and he needed to get his life sorted. You see, that was the first weekend. It was a Saturday night he came to the meeting. It was the first weekend, he said, in nearly 20 years that he'd been sober. It was the first weekend that he had spent it with, known, uh, he had spent it with Christian, Christian people and in Christian company. And he said he had never seen the like of it. And so that was the first week of the meetings. The second week he promised he'd come back again. And I thought he wasn't going to come back until the last night he came back to the meeting again. And again he said, I need to speak to the preacher. I need to get this matter of salvation sorted. I need to get these things sorted out. I need to get my life sorted for eternity. And so we came back again. And we talked to him different times. Different ones spoke to him one to one. And he said, I need to get saved. I've watched maybe 10 of us in the house, said, I've watched all of you, and I have never seen a, a happiness amongst you. And we were just sitting in somebody's house talking, weren't doing anything special. He said, I didn't realize you couldn't be happy unless you had a drink. And so two weeks after Northfield, he decided, no, 
He was considering Christ, but he would ponder upon it. He got a Bible. He would think about it. He didn't really know what his family would say. He didn't know what his friends would say. He didn't know if he'd maybe have enough Christian friends. He didn't know if he'd miss the, the drink, and maybe things were holding on to him. And so he said, no. He was nearly speaking to the preacher, and he said, no, I'll leave it, and I'll go home. Well, two weeks after Northfield, just two weeks on a Sunday night, I got a phone call to say that morning he'd been found dead in his bed, suffering a massive heart attack. And as far as we know, that man never accepted Christ as his saviour. You see, he died considering Christ. Man number one died rejecting Christ, and man number two died considering Christ. And then we move on to number three, Christ accepted. And the verses we read at the start all have the same phrase in them. The stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. You see, at the first, the stone was rejected by the builders. It was thrown away. And then I looked at this phrase, and I thought, I wonder what this means, the head of the corner. So I looked it up, and at first, it seemed to be that it was the stone laid at the very bottom corner of the foundation. That was just one view, and then I read a whole lot of reviews, and I sort of went with this one because it seemed to be the one that was the most popular. It said, the headstone of the corner is the stone that is put in the top to hold the two walls that are joined together. It's where the two walls meet. The chief cornerstone joins them. And you see, and as I got thinking about that, I thought, well, if we're not saved, we're here. And if God's here, there's a gap between us. And how do we bridge that gap? You see, it's the same as the gap between heaven and hell. If we're not saved and we're heading for hell and we want to be saved and heading for heaven, well, how do we bridge that gap? Well, there's only one thing to bridge it. And if I had the PowerPoint here tonight, I could show you. We show this to the children. It shows you one side of a mountain. Maybe you've seen it. It shows you another. And the cross is laid between the two. And man's free to walk from darkness into light, from not being saved to being saved. And the only choice we have tonight if we want to be in heaven is to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. The verse we read at the start says this, and it's important. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you see, again, going back to the stonemasons, as I would stand and watch them, the first time they threw the stone away, they didn't want to know. The second time they would lift the stone, they would look at it, and they would consider it, and they would fit it in, and it would work perfect, and as it was accepted. You see, is that like us tonight? Maybe tonight you've rejected Christ and you've hardened your heart. Have you considered Christ before? And maybe you're in this meeting and you've thought, I need to get saved. I need to get right before God, but then rejected him. Maybe tonight, as this meeting comes to a close, you've considered Christ and all you have to do is accept him. And maybe tonight you're here and you've accepted Christ. And when we accept Christ, isn't that great? And as we come to a close, let me tell you about man number three. But really, man number three isn't a man. He was actually a boy. In 2001, I started secondary school. It's going to tell you my age. It's okay. You can work it out. I'll not tell you. But I started school in secondary school in 2001, age 11 years of age. And two weeks before Christmas, 2001, this fella was heading home on the bus towards Down Patrick. And as he got off the bus, the bus drove away, left him standing in the middle of the road, and you probably know already what happened. He was hit by a car, and he was killed on impact. And so tonight, this might be sad. And I remember this, when this happened so well. And I remember going home, and my mum getting a phone call saying that he'd been killed in the road. And yes, it might be sad, but at seven years of age, that fellow trusted Christ as his saviour in a children's meeting. And so when he closed his eyes on earth, he woke up in heaven. You see, as he considered Christ at seven years old, he had two choices. And it's the same choice as then, as it was a hundred years ago, as it was a thousand years ago, as it is today. And the two choices that he had was he could either accept Christ or he could reject him. And what did he do? Well, as this verse says, he made Christ the chief cornerstone of his life and accepted him for salvation. He accepted Jesus Christ as his saviour. And it was great just in the prayer meeting tonight to hear of a wee girl, I think it was, got saved just on Thursday night, is that right? On Thursday night, getting saved in the meeting. And there's no greater joy than leading a child to Christ. And there's no greater joy than an older person coming to Christ. And there's no greater joy than a senior citizen coming to Christ. I heard of one recently. They got saved two hours just before they died. 
It doesn't matter when you get saved, as long as you get saved. But the problem is, we don't know when Christ is going to take us home. You could walk out that door tonight, and you could be killed before you'd even get out through the gates. I remember a youth weekend a few years ago, as a fella got home, I think it was a man along, got killed on the road. And you see, like that stone that was rejected by the builders, what God has to offer may seem unpopular today. Many will not accept repentance of sins and complete lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives, but this is the only choice that we have if we want to have genuine salvation from our sins. And we must realize that the rejection of Jesus Christ does not make us free from God's judgment. Rather, our own rejection will be based on God's judgment and punishment. Don't think tonight because you're not saved that you're going to escape meeting God because you're going to meet God no matter what happens. And as surely as those who choose God will receive eternal life, those who reject him will be judged to destruction. But let's make one thing clear. Both are guaranteed to receive the consequences of your choice. No matter what way you leave this place tonight, whether accepting or rejecting, you have a consequence of your decision. So tonight as you leave, you have three choices. You can be like the builders, and you can be like man number one. The builders rejected the stone. Man number one left this earth rejecting Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And you can leave here like man number two left the meetings in Northfield that Sunday night. And you consider Christ, and you can consider Christ the whole way home. That fellow considered Christ the whole way home and for two weeks after, until he, was, until he died. But the problem with leaving here considering is you're not guaranteed one single minute. You might make it home, you might make it the whole way through this year. You might not even make it until this night's over. And so if you walk out that door, you may be considering him, but at the same time, you've been offered salvation and you're rejecting it. Or what about leaving here like man number three? As he stepped off the bus that day, he didn't realize that he was about to leave this earth. And he didn't realize that he was about to be plunged straight into eternity. But the thing was this, he had accepted Christ as his savior. He had his sins forgiven, and his salvation was sorted out for all eternity. And I pray as you walk out this door tonight, and you leave for home that you will be accepting Christ. If you're sitting here now and you're considering him before the end of the meeting, it would be great if you could accept him. As we close, I want you to forget about rejecting him. I want you to forget about all the things that's gone through your mind, all these what-ifs and all these buts, if I get saved. If you accept him, you will leave here with your eternal destiny secured. But if you reject him, your eternal destiny is secured also, but secured in hell. If you leave here accepting him, your destiny is secure for heaven. Your sins are forgiven. And as that verse at the back says, redemption through his blood, your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ with a place guaranteed in heaven. And so tonight, I don't know what you came here expecting. I don't know what you expected to come to hear. Maybe you thought it was a builder service, you were coming to hear me talking about concrete or blocks or something. Well, that doesn't matter. I could talk about them all day long, but it doesn't matter. Tonight, I want you to realize that you need to accept Christ as your Savior. If you're unsure and you want to talk to somebody, there's plenty of people here. You can talk to me if you want. You can talk to George. There's some elders here. Whatever, whoever you want to talk to. Maybe you saw some of the ones at the front, you know them singing. Some of the musicians, talk to anybody you want. We're here to help. And it'd be great if you left here realizing your need of salvation. We can't save you. There's nothing we can do to save you. We can point you in the right direction. And we can help you. And we're glad and we'll be happy to do that. So thank you for listening. I promised George I wouldn't go over the time. And I finished about four minutes or three minutes early. And so we're going to sing a hymn. It's on the board, 200.